Hello and welcome back to Slick Talk. This is the June 8th edition and this is going to be the Max Revs special. We had a really good time chopping it up with Max on his YouTube channel and we wanted to share it on our platform here. A, because of course we want to give a shout out to Max. We want to hopefully send some subscribers his way, but he was also kind enough to provide the mp3 files so that way if you're not in a position to listen to the show on youtube then you'll be able to play it right here on our podcast platform whatever you may be listening on we're pleased to bring it to you in that format as well this was a really fun talk so it started off talking a little bit about the history of blackstone um, how myself joe got started there and also, you know, just in general, a, a really good person-to-person uh, -person discussion of what reports are, what they look like, what the results mean to me, kind of like what the analyst process is. Then we got to delve into some other topics. We got to talk about bore scoring and Porsches, which is obviously a hot topic out there, especially in the Cayman community. We also got to talk, though, about other cars. You know, we talked about BMWs and bearings a little bit. We talked about what all Blackstone can do, you know, even outside of cars. We talked about aircraft a little bit. We touched on even the industrial applications. So we really delved into quite a bit, hence why it's an hour long. This is a little bit long relative to most podcasts we release. But again, it's a special edition. We had a really great time with Max. He had a lot of energy and it really was just something that we hope to do more of as far as engaging with other content creators. So I hope you enjoy and let us know any feedback you have on this episode and feel free to submit any ideas for other creators we should link up with. We're always looking for suggestions in that area, but now without further ado, here is the Porsche talk with Max Revs. Enjoy. <laughs> there that's it we're live uh, lucky sevens commented already so here we go we're on episode nine of the sunday lockdown boy did i need this lockdown myself it's driving me a bit crazy believe it or not this is the only time i talk about cars in the whole week and i've really got looking forward to this so i hope you look forward to this as well we've got a really interesting one here now i'm a bit of a geek myself a special shout out to chris so chris is a subscriber to the channel and he basically uses blackstone laboratories for engine oil analysis we'll come on to all of that in a moment but he was basically getting the latest report done on his car uh, i've got a little picture of him in his car let's bring this up on screen this is chris uh, tracking his uh, porsche cayman as you can see he, i think he's quite a regular track meet there you can see a bunch of other kind of porsche cars in the background so basically chris kind of reached out to me and said look i deal with blackstone i'm their customer do you want to sort of get together and kind of do something on engine oil analysis and you know what like in, in europe i'm not sure how common this is i know you folks in the us may be more familiar with this stuff but like, if you're not feeling well if your blood's a bit off you get a blood test done now i was amazed what these guys can do with an engine oil analysis so you give an oil sample we'll, we'll, we'll cover all that detail in a minute but i want to bring in joe joe is a senior oil analyst at blackstone laboratories so let me just bring him into the picture joe how you doing that you're on camera thank you so much for joining us on this channel here today so chris puts in touch with your company so like you know uh, let's just sort of hear a bit more about you a bit more about your company before we get into anything sort of technical if you can maybe give us a bit of a background to your role and the company that'd be great yeah, absolutely. So just before we get going, a compliment to your channel, your followers. Um, once you reached out to me, I think it was about a month ago, you know, I started digging into the, uh, your channel and your uh, following. And really, it's such an excellent, tight-knit community and people who uh, kind of crave that continuity and they have devotion to Porsche. And it's really been exciting to tap into that. So thank you for having me on. Um, I started with Blackstone uh, back in 2017, and the company itself, though, they've been around since 1985 and started with the founder, Jim Stark. And what we what he really imbued um, within the company was, you know, just to paraphrase a quote of his, you know, we don't hire doctors to explain our reports. We are the doctors. So Blackstone has always we've always strived to be conversational 
but factually based. And that's kind of carried on to uh, Jim's kids who now run the company, Ryan Stark, president, and Kristen Huff, VP. And with a background in engineering and English and uh, respectively, um, they've kept that legacy going of being fact-based, but conversational and to the point. So I was lucky to find the company um, pretty much fresh out of university. I was looking for an avenue to exercise content production. And Blackstone certainly has content production to do. Um, just to give you a little bit of perspective, I think after two years of being around, um, Jim had talked about sending out 16 reports in a day. Well, fast forward to 2020, and it's weird if I don't look at 16 reports before I take lunch. And that's just me, personally. So the growth has been there, and it's been there because we've always been represented um, you know, across owners of even just cars and trucks, to aircraft, to industrial application. Oh, wow. um, so we've made a name in all those fields. Wow. So do you, do you actually, what, what did you start with as a company then? Did, uh, you mentioned engine, like aircraft engines. So I didn't actually realize this. So was the, the founding of the company doing engine or analysis for any particular vehicles or was, you know, was it just wide ranging to start with? Anyone that, that could be sold to. <laughs> so basically Blackstone knew that oil analysis could be vital to literally anything that needs oil to do its job. So engines are obviously a focal point, but even just industrial application, um, just to share a quick story, um, Ford has a stamping plant um, here in the States and we happen to have an account with them. So they had a piece of machinery um, that was breaking down, but they didn't know it without the help of used oil analysis. They didn't know that there were literally pieces of gears coming apart. Yeah. Well, long story short was with a $15 analysis at the time, our prices have changed in the years since, um, but with a $15 analysis, they were able to prevent a $5 million repair. Wow. So situations like that have kept us in industrial, whether it's something as simple as a, a stamping press, hydraulic, um, any splash lubrication system. So we really are across the board, but I think a lot of people think engines first with us because um, you know, that's where we really get to be conversational and we get to really kind of uh, take part in the enthusiasm that people, especially um, Porsche owners have for their cars. So that's where it gets really fun to inject some personality uh, more so than you might find in other applications. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm really stoked about this because it's only about a year ago that I knew someone uh, selling uh, a Porsche. It's 911. And he kind of knew that the engine was having a few issues. And the reason that he wanted to sell the car is when he got the oil change, he, his, the closest he could get to checking the oil, he cut the oil filter in half. And I think you hold it up to mm -hmm. a light and you look for little fragments. But like, I'm right. thinking what you must be doing what goes well ahead of just looking for fragments in an oil filter. So. Well, that's what's fun because, I mean, that's obviously so it's always good to look at things closely on your end if you can. But we're catching things at the microscopic level far, be uh, far before, you know, you'll often find visible evidence. So visible evidence like, you know, pieces of metal in the filter, that can certainly be more evidence of a problem along with what we can find. But we're trying to catch things before you start finding um, the, the, the pieces that often translate to an immediate problem, costly repairs, so on. We really like to get in there in the early, early stages so people can save money and avoid having to make the most expensive repairs. Wow, that's cool. I'm just going to try and bring up uh, some pictures because it's a bit like a medical laboratory. So th these are some pictures. I know you can't see this right now, but it's it's essentially test tubes with a whole bunch of oil in them on like a wooden rack. And it's like, I mean, there's loads of test tubes. I guess you get loads of samples coming in. Is it pretty much like, like a medical lab where, you know, you have to put a sticker on each test tube and trace it, which car it belongs to? And, you know, there was, I mean, I'll bring up one picture of a machine. So, I mean, I don't know what these, I guess yeah. whether they're centrifuges or, you know, checking what's inside the oil but it seems like almost like a medical lab over there like there's a lot of equipment that goes behind the scenes yeah yes absolutely so within you know the lab you're going to have a spectrometer which is going to detect elements such as wear metals and elements that point to contamination you're also going to have a centrifuge that's going to be used to uh, do an insolubles test and that's where we're going to spin out any solid material 
um, you know, solids that the oil filter is supposed to keep in check. So we look for a certain amount that can indicate the oil filter was used up or perhaps there was excess heat that the oil filter couldn't keep up with as far as, you know, solids that were being produced. Um, but yeah, we, I believe I sent you to um, a picture of a flashpoint chamber. Um, yeah, I don't know what the names are. But I did put them up on screen. So right. I've got one machine, which has got some kind of extraction funnel at the top. So I'm guessing it vents out. So Spectrometer. So. Yeah, I'm okay. sure that was involved. Uh, yeah. So it's, to, to keep all of that straight, we have a very precise as far as, you know, shipping and receiving goes. You know, we do 36 samples at a time uh, in, in a given what we call a run. And then it goes into the lab and we have stations for the amount of oil that needs to be taken out for each individual test. So it kind of goes through its process there. And then after the data is done, an analyst like myself will pull it up and then we will go through the numbers and we will kind of do a thorough check of everything as far as who the sample come from, what's the car, what's the engine. All right, now let's dig into the data and let's see what kind of narrative we're getting from these numbers. So that's kind of the process from the sample coming in the door, going through the lab, then coming to me where I'm going to look at the numbers there. Because a lot of people, I think, you know, rightfully so, assume that um, the same person who's unpacking is doing the test is you know kind of do and we certainly we have people who've done all who've done it all in the building um but yeah as far as getting that data to me i'm going to start matching up the numbers with the sample information and producing a narrative gotcha gotcha now i know there's a whole bunch of people i think there's more people that kind of subscribe to my channel from the state so for those people that are here in the comments section if you've heard of blackstone if you've used them before just put something down in the comments so i can get a, a feeling for this because I, I think in europe this whole engine oil analysis is i mean I, I wasn't aware of it. I'm not sure if it's much more of a US kind of based thing, but I, I think it's amazing that, I mean, so we're generally like a Porsche channel and some of the engines are known to have a few issues, shall we say? And there's a reason why, right. you know, ball scoring and Caymans and Porsche engines, it, it's just an internet like nut, Google just goes nuts. So, you know, th there's a reason that we, when we buy a car, we want to make sure it's in good nick. And I think I would love to know how many people in the US would ever thought, you know what, before I buy this used car, let me just send off a bit of oil. Let's find out for sure. Sure. It's not a guess. It's not, you know, I don't need to worry about getting the $2,000 warranty in case the engine's going to go. I mean, mm -hmm. what, just, what's the current price now just out of interest? If I lived in the US, how much could I get like an engine oil analysis done for? $30 will get you the standard analysis. And just to kind of suss that out a little bit, when people hear standard, I think they often consider that to be like a lesser package, like it's like uh, something that doesn't involve all the answers. But the standard analysis is quite comprehensive. So that's going to involve our spectral exam where we're going to look for wear metals. We're going to see how those match up with our averages. And then we're also going to rule out contaminants. Well, hopefully we can rule it out. If we find it, we'll have to point it out. Um, we'll look for contaminants like coolant and excess dirt, and that's all just contained in the spectral exam. We're also going to measure the viscosity to see if the oil has, you know, if, if you were really dead set on there only being a certain oil used, you wanted a 040 or a 540 in your Porsche, um, we're going to measure the viscosity and see what, what was being run. And then we're also going to check for, like I mentioned earlier, insolubles to see a gauge of oil filtration. So you wrap all that up in a standard analysis, you're really going to get a pretty thorough rundown um, of the engine's uh, current condition. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's try and get into a bit more detail. So we've got some of the guys chatting away saying uh, you're really well known in the BMW community. So I don't know if that's just a regional thing, but this guy basically says the BMW guys that they all know about you, they all use you guys. So let's kind of like get into this a little bit more. So I mean, in terms of like, um, like the people who kind of come to your company, so would you say that they're, they're track enthusiasts or they like mainly like BMW guys? What would you say are the, the main reasons that people come and use an, an oil analysis? So I, I would come to you if I'm going to buy buy a new car but then i think right. once i know that the car's you know good in good nick i probably wouldn't do it every year i can understand why chris who's your customer he gets it done every year because he tracks his car so what are the different mm -hmm. customer profiles that you kind of like you know try to meet in the market 
I would hesitate to say there's a dominant um, side because really even across like BMWs and Porsches, you know, a lot of people might assume, oh, well, these are all track guys. And true enough, a lot of them are, but you also have a pretty widespread, you have a lot of people who really keep them in the garage and they might just go to a show. They might take it out of the garage a few times a year. And you also have people who are very modification heavy. So maybe they aren't tracking, but maybe they are constantly adding some sort of mod and want to see how the engine, you know, if you're uh, adding more boost or if you are doing any sort of a tune, um, we'll have people who they will swear to it that they aren't really driving it hard. I don't know if I believe them all the time, but um, there's a good spread of track enthusiasts, people who just want to mess with the car as much as they can, and then people who just want to take really good care of it and they just love it and want to have it in their garage as long as they can yeah gotcha gotcha so a little, little detour i just had a question which has been going through my head i just realized you could possibly answer this so you know like i know some guys that got like hundred and fifty thousand miles on their porsche engine or two two hundred thousand miles on a bmw engine and they'll say religiously whether i do a thousand miles in a year or ten thousand miles i change the oil every year now this is a question that i'd love to know if it is just a black or white or whatever but let's just say I do a thousand miles a year and I put fresh oil in every year. Can oil just degrade and lose its goodness and lubricating properties as oil if it just sits in the car? Or, you know, what, what's the deal around that? You know where I'm so, coming from, yeah? In a very uncertain year where a lot of bad news has been going around, this is one piece of absolute good news I can give people. It's that you do not need to change the oil based on calendar time. Um, now I am all for peace of mind. You know, if, if for some people it's just going to come down to, I will feel better if I change it. And absolutely. But there's no, in a modern engine, the beauty of these things is they are sealed up tight. That means that corrosion or moisture buildup, that's not a concern. And when the oil is not accumulating moisture, when corrosion is not a big deal, you're not going to have the oil's condition be ruined simply by sitting in the sump. It's only going to accumulate metal with use. So if you're not having metal buildup, you don't have contamination, and it's not going to simply lose viscosity either. So you can keep things mileage-based, and that really simplifies things, I think. So no matter what you're doing, always count on all right, how many are right, if you're going to track hours? Sure. Or miles on the oil? Sure. But calendar time is something you can really put uh, put aside. And that goes for whatever you want to talk about, be it um, a BMW, a Porsche across the board. Wow, that is cool. So you heard it here, folks. So there's a couple of guys all going, I mean, I'm putting the comments up now, but they're all going like, wow, like, you know, that, that's it's a, great. It, it, it's, a hot, it's a hot take. <laughs> and, and, and would you say that's because the system is sealed? And it's in, so if I, if I bought a can of oil from the store and I took the lid off and I just left it open in my back garden, um, and let's just say, you know, a bit of moisture got in or whatever, is that when oil degrades and loses its properties? That's when I would not feel comfortable running it. Yeah, when you have moisture buildup, that's not supposed to be there. You know, there. I've heard some interesting opinions over the years here and there. People will say, oh, well, you know, I know there's going to be some water, but some water is okay. It's normal. And I just kind of shudder at the thought there should be no measurable water in engine oil. Now, it doesn't mean that if that uh, a certain amount is, is going to condemn the engine for life, but ideally... The way these things leave the factory, there's not going to be water, or at least there shouldn't be. So if there is water, I'm going to assume contamination of some sort, you know, probably a coolant leak being the source of moisture or so on. But yeah, keep, keep that oil sealed up in the garage. If you need to wait a while to use it for an oil change, that's fine. But as long as you keep that oil sealed up, you can count on calendar time not being a concern. That is cool because you know it always bugged me because I was thinking the oil that this garage puts in that could that could have been manufactured six months ago. It could be sitting in a mm -hmm. warehouse. So actually, you know, when do you start clocking that? When was that oil created? If you see what I mean? Yeah, exactly. People are going to. Well, I mean, and it makes sense. I mean, it's structure. It's it's a way to simplify things. You know, following dates and whatnot. So I totally, I totally understand it. But yeah, like you mentioned, I mean, there's going to be a. a 
unavoidable passage of time from manufacturing to shipping to buying to actually using the oil. So I, I can definitely take comfort myself in, in counting miles and not months. Yeah, that is great. Thanks, Joan. I really appreciate you kind of sharing this knowledge with us because, you know, th this stuff will save people money, you know, because if, if you're doing an old, I mean, if you're doing it for peace of mind, that's great. But, you know, some people mm -hmm. only do it because they think they're going to get some benefit out of it. So, you know, I, I take my hat off to you because the Porsche interval for the oils every two years. Um, mm -hmm. And I know, like, you know, if you speak to older people who, like, br British cars built in the 70s, like, they were pretty bad in terms of reliability. You may need to change your oil a lot more frequently mm -hmm. back then. But oh, that's right. fantastic. And that's the thing that's too, I mean, it goes along with our kind of the, the whole mission and, and why why the, the job is so fulfilling at times is we are at the end of the day saving people money, whether that's on oil changes or saving their engine or so on. You know, I feel like we did a good job in keep people's wallets as full as possible. So cool. OK, I mean, before we sort of look at some reports and kind of go through some of the details there, can you kind of say that? Uh, actually, you know what? Let, let's go through a report instead. We'll do that first. And then maybe Absolutely. later on we can talk about some of these horror stories. So it, it's only fair that we look at Chris's car to begin with. So um, I mean, he's the guy, right. if you missed the beginning, it's Chris that gets his car checked with Blackstone every year, I think. And he's reached out and put us together. So it's only fair that we do this. So this is uh, Chris's report up on screen. Now, he's. I, I'm just going to start and point out the dates here because he's obviously had his car in here at three different times. Uh, oh, where are the dates? I'm trying to think. Oh, there we go. So it's 2018, 2019, and 2020. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's a whole bunch of elements on the left. Now, I don't know if, if it's worth going through each one, but can we just sort of start? If I look at the – I'm looking at the 2018 column on Chris's Oil. And right. when when I get this, like – when, so when Chris said this to me, I was like, well, what does it mean? Okay, So you're, you're right. in the lab. You're in the lab. You're, you're kind of looking at this data. Where do you where do you start with first in terms of is something going wrong? Do you look at the highest number, like there's a big number against calcium, or do you go straight to a particular element and then go, right, this is where I'm going to start? So I want to start at the top, and I want to start with wear metals. So going right from the first one, we have aluminum, and then chrome, iron, copper, lead, tin. So these are going to be the wear metals that we're going to look at you know, for just about any engine and I want to see how these look in relation to each other. For example, most engines, you know, the majority of wearing parts are going to be steel. So a problem with any part there is going to show up as iron. Um, but mainly, though, with that sort of knowledge, I want to see, OK, is the dominant metal iron? OK, well, that's that's normal for this engine. That's good. All right. What's it followed by? And in this case, it's normal for it to be followed by aluminum and then copper. So I'm just kind of taking a really broad stroke approach here. I want to see how these metals look in their balance. And then I'm just going to take these levels on their own. And I like the fact they're so low in the single digits. Um, I'm not even getting to averages yet. And the main reason why is after you've looked at thousands and thousands of samples, you kind of know how realistic it is for metals to be, you know, low and how low they can go. And really, these numbers are just fantastically low for oil with any significant amount of mileage on it. Um, you just can't really get much lower because another thing that might blow a lot of people's minds is that you never get all the oil out with every change, right? You're going to have about 20%, give or take, um, is going to be carryover from the last fill. All right, so there's going to be a little bit of metal there. You're going to have metal made during the oil run. And then you'll even have some traces here or there in unused oil that are just residual from you know the manufacturing process. So add all that together and looking at each of Chris's samples, but especially this first one, I love how low the metals are. You just can't really ask for results much better than this. Um, and there's nothing unnerving about how these metals stack up. So that's kind of the first area that I would go to. And I definitely like what I have so far. Cool. OK, just one question before we move off the metals. If you were to sample fresh oil out of the can, as it were, would it actually show any of these metals in there or would it be zero? Um, typically, you'll see one or two parts per million um, of any given metal. You know, it might be one ppm of lead or iron or what have you. Um, you're going to see one or two, sometimes a little bit more in um, unusual cases. Going to have a little bit there. It's 
I would say it's more unusual for me to look at a sample with zeros down the line than it is for me to look at a sample with at least a PPM here or there. So it's really quite normal and fine. Like that's that's not a problem at all. Brilliant. And just in terms of reading the report, there was kind of like the universal averages and then there's the kind of unit location averages. Well, what's the difference between those two average columns? Yeah, so the unit location averages are a big advantage if you sample repeatedly because those are just going to be based on your own samples. I see. I see. So we, we like to use universal averages as a starting point because that gives you, you know, let's say, for example, all of the 3.6 liter flat sticks samples we've seen okay well that gives that lets you know what a typical sample is but yeah location averages honestly are what i rely on um as as the customer builds more and more of a file because not every engine wears alike and that's fine they don't have to um, we want to see how things look on a consistent basis Wow, so this is quite impressive. So I mean, because this is Chris's report and he's tracking his car, so let's just say the engine's going through kind of like a heavy cycle. Even if he's not mm -hmm. doing a lot of miles, the, the, the few miles he is doing on this car, we can see that it's pretty much like, what, 4,000 miles there? 4,000 miles yep. a year. If we're going to say that they're you know, quite a lot of track miles, does this actually go to show maybe how bulletproof the engines can be that so little metal is coming off the block. I mean, is there anything that we can read from this report compared to say like another manufacturer? Like obviously these numbers are quite consistent, like six, five, four, but if there was another mm -hmm. car, let's just say, you know, a BMW, for example, and the numbers were like 12, 12, 15. So, so they were quite consistent, but just higher. Does that just mean that mm -hmm. the engine could be wearing a little bit more than other blocks in other manufacturers cars? Uh, not necessarily, um, but I mean, th this does these uh, series of reports. Excuse me, it really does work as kind of the best possible advertisement for a Cayman <laughs> that Porsche could ask for, um, just with how consistently low these readings are. But engines that make more metal, um, that is an important distinction, and some of them do. Um, when engines make more metal, it's not necessarily a problem with the engine, but it is important to monitor that and keep your intervals conservative. If an engine makes more metal just by rule, then you would probably want to change the oil more often just to prevent too much accumulation from building up. But I wouldn't say that's necessarily a manufacturing flaw so much as it is a characteristic unique to how it's made. Um, but yeah, engines that make more metal. Sometimes that does call for a different maintenance plan. Um, here, if um, I'm not sure if Chris had asked about extended oil use, but if he was asking us if he could have run any of these oils longer, um, we absolutely would have been on board with that. So it's important to see how much metal that engine's making from sample to sample, not only just to find a problem, but to see what the ideal interval is. Gotcha. And you know, like, I guess from all your kind of analysis and all these different kind of reports, would you say that is it kind of like certain manufacturers blocks may have more metal in the oil or is it more a usage characteristic as opposed to certain blocks from certain manufacturers? I would say it's very usage heavy um, because you'll find, like I said, uh, the the Subaru community, I, I didn't mention them earlier, I don't think by name, but um, as far as people who modify and modify a lot, um, you'll see that quite a bit in Subaru samples. And that will that can drastically change the wear profile from what that engine would have been doing straight from the factory. So I think it that's an example where you can really see um, maybe more metal. And that wouldn't really be fair to attribute to Subaru so much as maybe what people were doing if they wanted to ramp up the power as much as possible, um, as much as those little EJ25s can handle. Um, or you're going to see engines like this Porsche, which don't necessarily need any special treatment. Um, they're just handling the use that they were meant for. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, and I know I've just got one last kind of question on this. So let's just say but while we're on the metals and we haven't kind of moved on to the other items, let's right. just say that the engine was suffering from ball scoring or something. Uh, where, okay. where out of these metals, would you notice it out of the top? Yeah, so with bore scoring um, in, in this engine, um, you're going to look for that like much like we would any other cylinder area issue. So primarily, you're going to see things like aluminum and iron. 
And sometimes you'll see some chrome in the mix there, too. But aluminum and iron, that's what's going to show trouble like piston scuffing or, you know, iron's going to be from the cylinder walls themselves. And then you have aluminum from the pistons. So bore scoring is going to register. You're going to see those metals in some cases, pretty darn high. Um, it really depends how long people have run the oil and how um, bad the problem is. But yeah, I'm absolutely going to look towards those cylinder area metals to indicate a problem like bore scoring. But one interesting engine to kind of bring into the conversation on that um, would be the 3.6 liter flat six. The unique thing there is the, uh, the cylinders are actually aluminum and silicon based. And you're going to see aluminum from the pistons too two and then iron's going to be in there as well so that's a unique case where we're going to go a bit further down the page and we're going to look to a high silicon number along with aluminum to indicate a problem like bore scoring but that's kind of something unique to that engine um, otherwise in most cases we're going to look mainly just to aluminum chrome iron that's cool. So I'll tell you what, you refer to things further down the page. Let's tell that Max guy to shut up for a bit and allow, allow you to kind of walk down through the report. But but that's what I was thinking. I was thinking if I got the report done on my car, the thing that I want to look for is ball scoring. Where do I look? And right. You've kind of answered that brilliantly. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. So moving further down the page, um, I think the next you know, a noticeable element you can see at any significant level here is molybdenum. And that is going to be anti-wear additive in the oil. It's going to serve the same purpose as elements like phosphorus and zinc way further down. And other relevant elements, I would say, in, in, in the samples we have here um, would be boron, calcium. You have a little bit of magnesium in there, too. And all three of those elements are going to be detergent dispersant. Um, additives that hold particles and suspension so that they can be filtered. So we look at these elements, um, of course, in each sample, but you'll notice we won't flag a high calcium level or a high zinc level or, or so on. Um, these levels are going to vary depending on what brand or blend you run. So given that averages are based on the engine type and various owners are going to run whatever brand they like, uh, you're going to see levels vary, and that's normal. Um, that's We get a lot of emails and uh, questions about this where they'll, I think folks will sometimes assume, oh, well, you, you didn't mention boron. Did you notice that's very high? <laughs> and and uh, we definitely, uh, one thing about us is we, we give you the honest take on anything that we think would be a problem. So um, if we left it without a mark, good chance it's something like that. It's an additive element um, that's going to vary a little bit, and that's okay. I mean, yeah, one thing that would be quite handy for you, I mean, I, I know I'm not actually a customer of yours, but it'd be quite cool just when I look at the report, knowing which additives kind of in the oil and therefore you haven't necessarily found it in my car. It's in the oil anyway, versus mm -hmm. the things that are coming out of my car and then making it on their way to your report. Right. And I would say just to, the last few elements to make note of that are not additives and they're not wear metals. You know, if, if we're going to find contamination like, say, coolant contamination, that's going to register as high potassium and high sodium usually. And it's that's where it's important to know what is in your oils additive package and what isn't, because a lot of oils do use sodium. So it's really important that we do pay attention to brand in that area and then if you're going to have a air filtration issue or, or anything where dirt debris is getting past the air filter that's going to register as high silicon so we we are looking at those elements as well and again brand blend plays a really big role because if you're using an oil like redline for example that uses a significant amount of silicon as anti-foaming additive so it's important to let us know, hey, I'm running Redline, and that way, if we have some high metals and high silicon, we won't immediately jump to thinking about an air filtration problem. We might know better that that silicon is probably just additive. Um, so those elements, we definitely want to know what brand or blend you're running so we can give you the most honest interpretation of them. This is fantastic. So I'm learning a lot. Let me know in the comments if you're learning on this stuff because th this is amazing. And I think what kind of uh, where I'm leading with kind of like what I'd like to talk about next is that the, the oil kind of characteristics of the different brands out there. So you said some of them will have mm -hmm. more protective capabilities, so they might have more kind of like the boron or the potassiums. From your perspective, if a customer said to you, this is the car that I run, 
what's the best oil I can use, just say for normal everyday usage, do you get involved in making recommendations or do you kind of stay out of that bit? Well, it's been made really easy for us um, in, in, in that light because we have had the benefit of looking at thousands and thousands of samples specific to engine type, whatever you want to talk about. And we really haven't found that having more or less of a given additive translates to better wear, better engine wear, longer life, what, whatever you want to talk about. So really, we can simplify it for folks and find that generally, if you're following the owner's manual and you're picking an API certified brand or blend, you're going to be in good shape. And sure, you might have slight changes in wear from one brand to the next, but nothing more than we could probably attribute to just changes in day to day driving, uh, maybe higher RPMs, shorter trips, or changes in track, like whatever you want to uh, cover. So really, it's easy for us. Um, we get the question all the time, what oil is best for my engine? And just for anyone listening, if, if you want a detailed kind of rundown about, um, you know, how we apply the data and how we really do look at this stuff closely, we actually have a newsletter on our website where we covered this very topic. And you can see you can see the numbers for yourself and see the performance of various br uh, blends, be it uh, Amsoil, Royal Purple, you name it. So we have dug into it um, quite closely. And we have found that really there's not a noticeable difference in where people will always report uh, changes on their end, which I, I don't think they're invalid. Like some folks will swear by their engine running quieter um, with a certain brand, or they'll mention they had, um, you know, better fuel economy or so on and so forth. If you're noticing things like that, all, all for it. But what we look at is engine wear. And if we're not seeing a noticeable difference, then I would have a hard time advocating for one oil over another. Yeah, that's a great answer. Because I think one thing that surprised me when Chris reached out to me and we kind of thought we'd make put this video together, he told me that he's switching to Amazon's basic oil. Because mm -hmm. I, think, I mean, I, I don't, I don't even know if we've got that in the UK here. But like, I th I'm guessing he's coming out of Mobile One and he's going to use Amazon. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow, you know, this could be some yeah. a, a big player really shaking up the market. Because I'm guessing it's going to mm -hmm. be a hell of a lot cheaper. Yeah, and uh, well, price point is obviously going to be the first thing that I think that attracts people. But yeah, it's just going to be a game of how long the name is around before people start to trust it. Because, for example, super tech oil here in the States is is getting more and more of a foothold, I think, as far as how often I see it. And that's produced um, uh, by Walmart. So people are slowly, slowly gaining trust with it. But again, it's API certified stuff. As all the additives that you're going to find in more expensive oils, albeit maybe at different levels. But that's been a point of anxiety for a lot of people, I think, have, has been, well, I'm not sure about this because it's from Walmart. Yeah. And that's going to be the same thing with Amazon Basics for a while. But soon enough, people are going to run it more and they're going to get it checked and see that, wow, it really has all the ingredients that I'm going to get in another oil like Amsoil or Castrol or what have you. Wow, cool. OK, so here's, here's one question for me, because it was something that I was considering the last time I got an oil change. Is when I look at the owner's manual, I think it says for my car, it's a 0W40. Uh, Nate, right. you're quite good at the facts. Correct me if the Cayman is not 0W40. But then and what somebody said is that obviously when the, so my car was a 2009 car so it's like what 11 years old and when these mm -hmm. cars get older someone always said you can you can run a different oil like either it's thicker or thinner i can't remember which way they go but they kind of say that you, you don't use the oil they say in the book you kind of use a different one because the engine's older is that something that you can talk about that's something that, again, I, I would be interested to know the reasoning why exactly when, when, when people do advocate for that. Um, I'm not sure that there's any particular reason why you would have to. Um, but again, when people want to change between um, maybe a 040 and a 540 just based on weather, for example, that's a really common thing. Um, again, I don't think that's going to hurt the engine either. It's such a slight change in viscosity. But really, when engines get older, I don't think that necessitates a change alone just based on age. Um, so it's something that you could, of course, check into with your sampling if you want to see how that how that compares. But engines won't necessarily need a different oil just based on age. Um, there can be other factors going on, like a lot of time people will use um, like Lucas oil stabilizer um, if they're trying to do things like slow down a leak or things like that. And that's a, you know, an, an ad, 
very real measure you can take and, and one that can be successful for some people. But just based on age, I don't think that necessitates a change. Cool. Okay. And just got, we're coming back to that kind of like the Walmart stuff. We've got, we've got a guy from Germany that's basically saying um, he reckons that these these Walmart and these kind of big brand oils, they're probably made in the same factories that do the other oils anyway, because, you know, they're not going to spend the time to research their own oil. It's a bit like, you know, your kind of breakfast cereal. You get your Kellogg's Corn right. Flakes and you get the, mm -hmm. the, the unbranded supermarket version, which may have been coming out of the same factory. Yeah, I would say they are spot on. And then another thing, too, is like if there was one with, with the amount of power play in oil production, I think if there was one brand that found the secret additive, well, it's going to get out there like it's it's going to be shared. And that's why all these oils look really quite similar um, in terms of their makeup and, and the ingredients they have, because I think I think within this industry, people know what's going on as far as what's being used what's the latest in, in either um, production or uh, recipe, what have you. People know. I think these trade secrets are passed around, so that's why so many of these oils look the same, and I would absolutely agree. They're probably, you might have them made in the same building. Yeah. So this question is kind of coming from someone, but I'm not sure if I've understood him correctly, and that's before an oil change is done, you could put cleaning additives into the engine oil. Is that is that something that you've heard of? Yeah, it's really quite common for people to run an engine flush and then change the oil, something like that, which that's fine to do. It's something that we want to know about if you did, because it can have an impact on the results. So if you use any sort of solvent based cleaning product, then that can mimic fuel dilution by lowering the flash point. And it will also, in some cases, depending on how much is present, it might even uh, lower the viscosity too. So it's fine to do. It's certainly not going to cause issues. But if you say you suspect a fuel system issue, like you're convinced you have an injector or maybe you want to look and see if an injector is leaking, maybe don't use an engine flush before you sample because that will cloud our ability to really gauge fuel dilution. So if you're looking for a problem like that, maybe wait to use a flush. Cool, brilliant. Okay, that that's fantastic. So I, I know the, mm -hmm. the answer to the next question, but I want to hear it from the expert. Okay, so I think we did a poll on this channel a while ago, and it was around: um, do do any of the people let do, do they just like start the engine and gun it and go nuts before the engine oil temperature heats up? Now we all we, we all kind of know we want it. We wait for the oil to heat up, goes to uh, eighty degrees C, I think is what it is, and then you can start going about four thousand RPM. Some of the guys on this channel were like, I don't care. I start the car and I just put my foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were like, no, no, that's bad. That's bad. But is there anything that, you know, about getting the oil up to temperature? What is it about getting heat into the oil that offers it more protection to the engine? Well, I've heard the argument and I think I would agree. I would tend to agree with this argument that the majority of engine wear probably takes place when you turn the key. Um, just because the oil has not been circulating within the engine. So I think I think that that would make sense in my mind. It's something that's very hard to kind of establish in testing as far as, you know, getting that precise of operation and then testing the oil. It's kind of hard to really dig into that area of detail. But I think that makes sense in my mind. But more, I would look to other factors, too. Like if someone is is the type who wants to start the car and drive it right away, well, they tend to probably engage in more spirited use than other people anyway. So I think you're also going to have yeah, the point. more short trips, the higher RPMs. You know, it's not going to be your nice cruise highway with few heat cycles, that sort of thing. So I wouldn't say that's the only thing I would take into account. I'd want to dig a little deeper, but I think it would make sense if the majority of engine wear took place right away. And then maybe that person is also kind of exacerbating things with the way they drive after they start it. So I want to look at the whole picture, but I don't think that, you know, in my mind, I'd be opposed to that idea. Cool. You know, I think this explains why you're a senior oil analysis, an analyst. And, you know, like, can I sort of maybe go off the oil for a moment? But I guess as a, as a child, were you quite inquisitive? Because I can see you've got this mindset like, like Columbo, like an inspector. Like you look at the report, it's not just numbers. It's interpreting the data, what's behind mm -hmm. it. And you kind of put together a whole story. So uh, would you say that you're, you're quite into the, you know, what does this thing mean? It's like, you know, really getting into it. Well, I guess if you wanted to reach back to my roots, I probably first wanted to be a journalist growing up. So I think we do have a little bit of foundation there. Um, but what's really uh, interesting on the day to day is that 
we kind of have to play the role of a detective when we're looking at these numbers every day in the sense that customers usually aren't terribly forthright um, with all the information on the slip. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but people don't necessarily know what we're looking for. So sometimes they won't say much. So we'll look for any context clue we can. Maybe you have some sort of race acronym, like like a track acronym in your email handle. Maybe you have a have a client name that indicates what you might do with the car. Maybe you name the car. You know, we have a unit ID for every given uh, car that's sampled. And if people write something like the beast and it has a track email <laughs> and they didn't mention anything else on the slip, I might still wonder about things like hard use modifications that sort of thing lending some insight into the results so you do have to take the role of a detective sometimes especially when people are maybe they don't know what we're looking for yet so they don't say much and then after we send them a report or two they might want to fill us in on the details but you do have to take everything you can into account to really give people the most thorough uh, report possible so definitely a little bit of journalism taking place this is cool. You know, I'm actually tempted to try and get one done myself, uh, but it just got me thinking, do, if customers, do they generally send you the oil sample, you know, via the drain plug of, because they're having all their oil change? What if I said I wanted to get my oil tested now? Is there any way of kind of extracting it from mm -hmm. the filler cap? Yes, absolutely. So if you wanted to take a sample just through the dipstick tube, um, you can do so using a hand pump. And that's just going to feed some uh, refrigerator tubing, like, you know, just very small quarter inch. And it's going to allow you to draw up a sample, you know, enough where you definitely aren't needing to change the oil or even necessarily top off the sump when you're done. And you can order one of those off our website, actually. So okay. cost of the vacuum pump is 35 dollars us and then you can also you know order the test and then you can take a sample without changing the oil and that's a really big help to people especially when they are maybe exposing their vehicle to sporadic you know hard use and they want to know, hey do i really need to change it just because i did one track day yeah, yeah. let me see if i can avoid that because oil changes they are more expensive by the day so yeah. that's a way we can help you hold off on maybe dumping six or eight quarts of royal purple that's really cool. I mean, one of the questions we had came in from Andy and he was kind of like, you know, are you ever coming to the UK? Or I mean, I'm based in the UK, but I guess as a mm -hmm. firm, you're US centric and basically all the samples come to you. So do you, do, you get, do you get people sending you samples from outside of the US? Is it like a worldwide kind of uh, how people send in their samples? It is worldwide. Um, I don't have uh, the exact amount of countries, but I think pretty much anyone that I could name, um, I believe we have seen samples from. Um, even just, I remember talking to the, uh, about a week ago, I mean, I had two aircraft samples from Iraq. Um, I had, you know, samples from uh, Chile, you know, the, the, the day after that. So really, it's everywhere. And you can order a test kit, we will send them to you wherever you are. If, if you can get postage, we can send you a kit. So we really are not limited at all. And um, uh, most of our international business, I would assume is, is going to be aircraft related. Um, but it doesn't matter whatever you have, if it needs oil to do its job, we can certainly test it. So yeah, we, we go everywhere. Wow. So let me know in the comments if this is something that you would consider, because I'm thinking of doing this because I'm about, I don't know, 14 months into my oil and I haven't driven the car. We're in lockdown, so the car's been going nowhere recently. Mm -hmm. And I know that the Porsche kind of intervals every two years. Now, I'm always thinking it's too long. It's too like I bought a new car ages ago mm -hmm. when it was a BMW. And I think the book said, don't change the oil for the first 8,000 miles. And I said, you're mm -hmm. crazy because my thinking yeah. was when the block's new, you're going to get fine bits of metal come off. So I got the oil mm -hmm. changed, oil and filter at 1,000 miles. But I don't even know if, if, if it was worthwhile. Did I have to do that? Because you know, whereas mm -hmm. if I just had a sample done on the oil, I'd know straight away. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And one thing that's another thing that's really unique to Porsches and uh, it's just a credit to them. Their engines look pretty fantastic from the jump. Usually um, wear in samples will have, you know, compared to a lot of other manufacturers, they will have generally metals that are already pretty close to average. Um, I won't see a whole lot of metal. Now, you'll still see improvement. 
um, as the engine matures because there is some wear in there. But it's really not uncommon for those samples to straight away look pretty good. You'll have some areas where um, there could stand to be improvement, but it certainly doesn't surprise me that they have an 8,000 mile you know, suggestion in some cases um, just starting out because there's not going to be a whole lot of metal accumulation there usually. So that's just kind of a credit to their process. They tend to look great from the jump. Wow, that's that's impressive. So you know, like, I, I saw mm -hmm. some of the sheets that the customers kind of submit their mileage. So can you say mm -hmm. that you've had some car engines come into you, not aircraft, but like car engines, like mm -hmm. hundred and fifty thousand miles, two hundred thousand miles? Have you seen some real high numbers? I mean, when it comes to diesel engine applications, it's not unusual to see numbers in the millions. Um, wow. If it's if it, yeah, it, it can happen, uh, believe it or not. Um, if it's going to be a gasoline engine, you know, you can see really some people who have gone the extra mile to keep those things on the road for 400,000 maybe. Um, you know, uh, old Toyotas, old Hondas that have just been carefully maintained. And I would say Porsche and BMW, you don't see as high mileage just because people aren't driving them as much, I don't think. You're just not getting the opportunity to accumulate that mileage. Not to say they couldn't, but as far as especially manufacturers like Honda and Toyota, you'll see some pretty ambitious odometer readings. So that's certainly impressive. And diesel engines that are made to go even longer, um, you know, they can rack up some impressive numbers too. But yeah, Porsche, I think it would get there. It's just people in general aren't going to be racking up so many miles. Yeah, you kind of raise a really good point there because part of me is thinking if, if people are quite gentle on packing on the miles on their Porsche, that's why we don't get to see so many high mileage Porsche cars mm -hmm. out there. It's not that they right. cannot do them. It's just that owners don't want to do that to their cars. Whereas, and I've got a Honda. There's a bunch of people on there. We've got our, our family cars, a Honda. Uh, we, we, yep. just, we just abuse them, abuse them, and they just keep on taking it, you know? Yes. No, I, I had a uh, an Accord myself, and that car was fantastic. The only reason I didn't keep it around was because um, I just I needed more room. It was a coupe, and I'm you know, I'm six foot two, and when you slide into a two door coupe every day, sometimes you get tired of it, and you all you know you need a little bit more room. But I I yeah, love that car. Cool. We, we just got a question coming from Germany, and um, so I, I have no experience with diesels, I have to say, but he's basically asked, um, why does the diesel oil get black so much quicker than the, the petrol engine oil, I guess? So is that something? Well, you'll, yeah. you'll see that black color, and it's it's going to mainly be related to soot. Um, soot buildup. And so when, when the oil goes in there, it's going to accumulate, um, you know, a little bit of soot along with the fact that it's going to be mixing with oil from the past fill, which is already going to be fairly black anyway, because of how diesel engine oil looks. So yeah, color alone, it's just not, uh, it's, it, it's a characteristic unique to diesels, but it's definitely not a problem. Um, a, a black color can really be pretty deceiving. Uh, you need to go a bit further because even a dark color that doesn't mean that it lost its viscosity it doesn't mean that it's you know overly oxidized or anything it's just going to be unique to the application so that's okay it definitely can feel a little disconcerting you know if you were to look at the oil and just see that color but i wouldn't lose hope and i wouldn't assume that the oil isn't working well it's just going to be a fact of life cool this is so great this is so great. we haven't even got onto some of the other reports i know these guys are quite you know anxious to ask you questions so if you've got any other questions for joe put them down in the comments but we'll come back to them in a moment so what i'd like to come on to there's another report we've got so i'm bringing up this report up on screen now i've just kind of put this down as a, a gasoline engine which is running unleaded petrol um so the column on the left hand side starts 3600 miles um and the aluminum numbers four. So th there were three reports we were discussing in total. Uh, this is the one. So at the top is 3,600 miles, then it's 11,000. Gotcha. Yeah, cool. So on, on this one here, uh, is there anything on particular you can kind of comment on this? Because I, I know this is one of the reports that we thought we'd go over, but I was trying to right. figure out, you know, to my layman's eyes, I couldn't quite figure out mm -hmm. <laughs> what was good or bad about this one. Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to offer up this one because it's a great example of how we can detect coolant contamination and the impact that, that can have on engine. So if we go a bit further, to, uh, more to the right-hand side, we have a sample from 725-2018. 725-20. And that oh, one yeah, starts that's right. with... So, yeah, that's the fourth column along, guys. Yeah, there we go. So we had about 11,000 miles on the oil. 
So what jumps out to me is we have a whole lot of potassium and sodium. So that's surefire evidence of a coolant leak. Well, like I mentioned earlier, some oils use sodium as additives, some gasoline engine oils, but there's no reason for that amount of potassium to be in a gasoline engine other than glycol-based coolant. So we have that. And we also have some fairly high wear levels, nothing that looks terrible for the mileage on the oil. But then we can see a definite change in the narrative in the 4-22-2019 sample. And if you're following along here, what we have is a drastic increase in potassium, a big increase in sodium, and you have some silicon there too. And when you have a whole lot of uh, coolant in the oil, you can also get silicon from it as well. Um, but it could also have been dirt, sealers, any silicone-based lube. But what you see here, though, is in conjunction with coolant, you have wear metals that definitely took a turn for the worse lead from the bearings that tends to be an area first affected by coolant you have iron which is probably from supporting steel shafts maybe cylinder walls as well and then you have aluminum from the pistons all on the high side so we can see some reductions in that latest report with 3600 miles in the oil that's just because the oil didn't have as much time to accumulate coolant and metal but nevertheless, the problem was still there. So I definitely want to forward these because they just give you a surefire example. Maybe for anyone out there wondering, can you really find a coolant leak? And what can you tell me about how it's treating the engine? This is just a really good case in point. That's fantastic. Do you feel kind of like, do you get a buzz when you kind of like look at these reports and you kind of go, oh, I found you, I found you? Because the customer may not even know about this, I take it. Exactly. And that's the advantage here is the oil. I mean, I remember looking at these samples. Um, they were for my brother-in-law. The oil did not have a milkshake appearance. It didn't have that sort of discoloration that people uh, tend to expect with coolant. So he was surprised. You know, I felt a little bit vindicated just because it's proof of of, uh, of our services and what we can do. Um, but that's the thing is he was able to then address this leak, you know, before the oil took that color, before the engine started to wear even worse. And so that's straight away the value of oil analysis because the oil didn't have an unusual appearance yet. Now, it could have easily got there, but we were detecting it beforehand. So it definitely feels good to help people catch a problem way before the engine fails. Yeah. I, I, and I know, like, you know, from, from kind of like a, a commercial, just like a, a cost point of view, e even I'm beginning to think this could save me money. Like, I, I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I think my shipping costs would be more than the whole cost of the actual analysis side of things. But, you know, I'm just thinking that you can really keep on top of things. So uh, I, I quite like that idea mm -hmm. because it, it's, it's a little bit of outlay. But the upside of something, if you do find something, is massive because you could prevent something quite costly happening. Correct. Yeah. And we're, we're looking to get in there on a microscopic level for you, which is at the end of the day, the only way you could get a better evaluation of the engine would be by literally taking the thing apart, which is uh, going to insert, uh, for some people, unimaginable cost. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. And then there was one more, which I think is a Honda engine. So I'm yep. just going to bring this up, up on screen. It was a 2.4 litre four cylinder engine. Um, and we've only got one set of readings on this oil. Um, mm -hmm. let, let me have a go. Let me have a go and try to read this. So I'm looking at this report. I think, okay, the metals look low to me. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Agree with you there. You know what? This is so. I'm thinking, what type of oil? Because I, I'm I'm looking at the numbers at the bottom, but they could be normal for this a particular brand of oil. Am, am I kind of right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So this, I believe, this was just a blend of Mobile One. So very typical additive package for Mobile One. But really, uh, the story of this one goes down into the oil's physical properties. So if you look down there, you can see some definite um, action going on. Okay, so we, did, we didn't actually cover these, but we're looking at the box at the bottom now, isn't it? The property yes. box. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I don't know. Let me have a look. 300. Oh, it's a fuel. Oh, fuel. We've got a bit of fuel. That's, that looks a bit higher than normal, yeah? Correct, yes. There so the go. flash point... <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Uh, the, the flash point temperature here is just 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you look at the column next to that 300 degree reading, you see 385, a flash point for this oil type, should be above 
385. Fuel took that flash point down to 300. And this temperature translates to 4.8% fuel uh, present, which is well, well over the 2% cautionary. And going just above fuel, you see the viscosity was on the low side of where it should have been. It was just 42.5 SUS. A 020 should be 46 to 56. So you see the impact of fuel there. And that's another thing that can be, you know, something that people can't really figure out on their own with a visual inspection. People will say, oh, this oil, I drained it, it just looks so thin. Well, it might look thin, but like zero W20 is thin. <laughs> like it, it, it just is, I mean, it's hard to assess just based on that if fuel is truly a concern. So you can use testing to actually get a read on fuel and see, okay, am I, Am I actually getting enough that it might be thinning the viscosity, causing other issues? So that's a definite uh, advantage there. This is absolutely awesome. So I've, I've learned a ton from this. Uh, I think I think I'm definitely going to check your website out. You kind of mentioned that you have some reports on the different kind of brands of oils and how they kind of like look. So you know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you've got a link, uh, uh, when this video kind of fi finishes processing, if you can add the link mm -hmm. to the video, that'd be amazing. Um, but one, Absolutely. One thing just to sort of, I guess, comment upon, you know, like you kind of mentioned the Subarus and so they, they tune their engines a lot. So maybe that's why they're going to mm -hmm. show certain trace elements a bit more. In terms of like, you said the Porsche engines, BMWs. Is there any? If someone were to sort of almost show you a report, could you almost say, like, from your knowledge, what type of car it belongs to, or like, is there some kind of analysis? Because you must have like tons of mm -hmm. data in your labs. So right. I, I would love to kind of look at the data and kind of go, this particular engine in this manufacturer's lineup is more prone mm -hmm. to blah blah blah. Uh, so we're not saying the engines are bad. We're just mm -hmm. saying that you know that they show trace metals a bit more often. Are there sort of some general characteristics you can say about the different sports car manufacturers in terms of how what they show in their oil? Mm -hmm. Well, precisely. Well, one thing that can be kind of fun um, that I have done in the past with other senior analysts is we'll sometimes get samples in with a blank slip, no information. The customer forgot to write down anything. And I've done this a couple of times in the past where we just have a game where we guess the engine type, the car. Maybe we'll go right down to the color of the car. <laughs> and then we'll also guess the oil type and just keep that in our back pocket for when we get that phone call or email. I would say some of the easier ones to spot are BMWs um, because a lot of BMW owners like to run Castrol and Castrol blends, at least a few of them use titanium as an anti-wear additive. So if I see a sample rich in titanium and I see a wear profile that looks, you know, as far as BMWs go, S, uh, 65s and S85s are really common to see. And if I look at a profile where lead is either the dominant metal or really close to it that's pretty typical of bmws and then i can also see an additive package that resembles castrol then i can see a viscosity that reads well in the 10w60 range which is what most bmw owners at least for those engines are running i have a lot of information on my side to tell me you probably sample the bmw running 10w60 so it, it's something we will do we'll try and parse it down um but of course, we'll let the customer fill us in with more info if they have it, and then we'll adjust their uh, report if need be. This is fantastic. I've learned a ton of information from this. So, like, if you guys have got any questions, I know we've, we've kind of come, come up to the hour, so I know Joe's got some, you know, he's got a busy day. I've used up a lot of his time as well. So ask us the questions if you've got. There are a few more around, like, diesel and so on, but I guess yeah. – um, um, I think oh, I think he's just saying the diesel burns more than it's. Well, that's probably more to do with the engine. So I think I'll probably skip some of that stuff. Uh, that's about smell, um, OEM certification. So you kind of mentioned something about um, IP, something like uh, oil has to get a certain certification to be like worthy for sale. What was that kind of? Um, was it API? API. So that's yeah, the, uh, that, yeah. API. So American Petroleum Institute. Okay, got, okay, got you. Brilliant. And then mm -hmm. I think we, we've got a question here, which is about, um, do you recommend a longer drain time to get rid of all the old oil, say 24 hours versus one hour? I mean, ah. yeah, so not necessarily because you're never going to get the old oil out entirely unless the engine's actually turning over. So you can't get it all out period. Um, you might get a little more out than you would otherwise if you drained it longer. But without the engine doing its thing, 
um, you're not going to get that oil. It's not going to have a way to actually drain out. So, yeah, you might get a little more out and, um, you know, it's fine to do if you have the time to do it. But it's pretty challenging, I would say, to really get all the all the fill out. Gotcha. Brilliant. Okay. This is really mm-hmm. impressive. So what I'll tell everybody is that, Joe, you actually do some podcasts. So before this video, mm-hmm. there's a few podcasts on the Blackstone Laboratories. Make sure you do Blackstone Laboratories mm-hmm. and not Blackstone Labs, because I think that's some kind of like weightlifting channel yes. or something I found. So it's Blackstone Laboratories, okay? And you can see a few kind of podcasts that you sort of done there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just wanted to say, I think, I guess we've, we've kind of like, just wanted to thank you for your time joining on this yeah. channel. I wanted to thank Chris. If you have anyone else who's got any other questions out, there now's the time to ask them i mean is there anything else you'd like to sort of cover joe while we're here or no absolutely but th- thank you for giving slick talk a plug um absolutely feel free to look up that show and i would say um just last thing is if you have any topics that you would like us to cover on that show or maybe if you have some more questions for max and i on a future episode um absolutely submit them and we would love to cover them either on this format or mine maybe even a little bit of both it'd be fun to get you on the podcast and just talk about porsche community and you know kind of what got you involved so yeah if you have any questions out there that you would like us to delve into we'd be happy to well i think there's, there's a lot of people out here so yeah i think the questions are going to keep on coming and i think one thing i've really taken away from this is there's a lot of ball scoring myths everyone goes on about ball scoring and you've pretty much told mm-hmm. us that the reports are pretty consistent and from what you've seen so you mm-hmm. know and you've got guys tracking their cars as chris does so i think mm-hmm. this just goes to show that Okay, there might have been a few issues with a few cars like way back in the days, but you know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of myth and once something catches traction, it's hard to let that go. It, absolutely. And I think it tends to be the case where concern will almost always outweigh fact. And um, you're going to have that with any engine out there. But yeah, I, I do believe that a lot of manufacturers know how to take steps to address these things like BMWs and bearings. You know, bearing problems have long been a concern there. But really, we don't see it as often as we used to. And I think that speaks to BMW uh, addressing the problem, you know, in those S65s and S85s. So I would trust that manufacturers are capable of recognizing their flaws and, and, and making the changes. And I think you've seen Porsche do that in the past and BMW as well and so on. Fantastic. This is a fantastic talk. So so I, I got someone here that just sort of chatted about, you still want these videos to continue whether lockdown is there or not. Now, at the moment, I'm not sure what we're going to do. Next mm-hmm. week, we've got, um, one, it's the last one at the moment. It's the 10th series. And uh, we've got John Gados from, uh, he's coming down mm-hmm. from Soul Performance. So I think we're going to do exhausts next. But yeah, if you've got questions for Joe, um, either sort of submit them on the comments from here. Joe can pick them up later. And yeah, yeah. Joe's got a podcast out there as well. So check that one out. Enjoying Life and Castle Max. Joe, thank you so much for basically sharing your time with us here. Chris, thanks for the introduction for two Blackstone Laboratories and enjoying life and cars to the max. Until the next one. See you later, guys. See ya. Thanks.